20 years ago, uh, I, I felt God speak to me right in the early days when I became a Christian, saying that one day, somehow, uh, I would, and I didn't even understand what it meant then, um, that I would be involved with others in, in having, there would be some global impact to what we were involved in. Uh, now, in those days, you know, I, I'm not sure I know what it means now, but I knew even less what it meant then, but I've, I've never forgot it. It was a very, very powerful forming word that God put in my heart. No, nobody prophesied to me. It was like one of those things where you just feel God has met with you and said something. Uh, so it went very deep into me. And so all the, the journey then with New Frontiers and the, the, one of the things I loved about New Frontiers and when Terry started it and how it all grew was just the, the eyes uh, we, our eyes were always being lifted to the horizon, to the to the to the nations, and uh, really learning a love for God's global purposes and feeling caught up in that. So even though I'm, you know, living on the east coast of the UK in a not particularly influential place, I think wherever we're living, we're all part of the family that is caught up in global purposes. We're a global family, and so it kind of gives you a sense of. Um, I suppose, dignity in God to feel that there's something very world affecting about who we are because we're God's children and Jesus has got a purpose for the globe, for the world, and, and it's a privilege to be caught up into his purposes. So to do this tonight when we're sort of almost like putting a bit of a marker now in the ground and saying, right, as a family of churches, we're now lifting our eyes to the global horizons uh, as the part of the next phase of what we're doing. Um, and, and it's going to take, you know, very purposeful prayer. Some of you are, are, are here because you feel a real sense of being like Epaphras, keen to wrestle in prayer for important things. And uh, it's going to take that. And we, we, we've begun a sort of um, prayer warriors group for those who feel that kind of thing. Uh, and, and that's going to be strategically enormous. You know, the air war has to be won before you send the ground troops in. And, and the air war of prayer, we, we're, it's going to take, you know, a lot of purpose for us to do that. It's also going to take a lot of money and investment. My good friend Edward Buria in Kenya says preaching the gospel is expensive. And he's right. And even in the book of Ecclesiastes, which was referred to earlier, it says money is the answer to everything. It's in the Bible. So it's, uh, it must be true. So there's things that we've got to understand. Prayer, money, these things really make things happen. And it was good just listening then to, Dole, uh, to, to Joel and Dan about they'd started a business. And out of that, then a church becomes possible. And, and for many, I think going forward, the answer will be some kind of of um, sustainable income generation, wealth creation, business kind of skills that you've got alongside then a kind of a missional church planting thing. That will happen more and more, not all the time, but I think that's going to become a feature more and more. So to hear that from Dan and Joel is a very good template for us to then say, well, that's, that's probably going to be typical of, of quite a number of, of other situations. And it's going to require people going relocating, moving to other cultures, moving to other places is going to require people supporting those who have gone, having good supply lines so that people who go don't end up feeling isolated, but we have good supply lines. Whenever you read about military campaigns that went wrong, it's because the supply lines stopped getting to the front uh, and you might have the best troops on the front line, but if the supply lines get interrupted, then that can really hinder the progress. So we want to make sure that we put things in place that are sustainable and we have good teams. Ideally, we plant in teams, but also we have teams of, of uh, translocal ministries that are serving the churches and the church plants as we begin to see, see expansion coming. And it will also mean that we will find men and women in the nations who God connects us to, and they will be looking for a spiritual family, they will be looking for uh, values where they connect with, with us as relational mission. Some of them will go on to have their own apostolic families, and they, may, they will call it something different from relational mission, but nevertheless, it's a family thing, and I think that that will happen in Europe, particularly where we couldn't possibly plant a thousand churches ourselves, but imagine if we saw 50 apostles uh, 
identified, trained and released across Europe, you suddenly find 50 people who can then plant uh, the 20 churches each. And it then becomes something you think, well, actually, I could imagine something like that happening. So whatever nation you're in, it's about uh, or wanting to go to, it's about raising up ministries that then can do the work uh, rather than it being like a franchise of the UK or anything like that. So just a few thoughts from some verses that really have been important to me for many years. Isaiah 60 uh, verses 1 to 4 speaks about, I think, uh, the vision that God is, has for the nations and that we are caught up in. It says, arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you and nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be carried on the hip. Then you shall see and be radiant, and your heart shall thrill and exult, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. That's a wonderful prophetic promise there. So just to pick a few thoughts out from that. First, it says nations, in verse 3, nations shall come to your light. Now, Jesus is the light. We're not the light. Nations are going to turn to him. It's his sons and daughters we're speaking about. It's his kingdom. It's him that will have the nations coming to him. He is the light, but because we are in him, because it's a family business, Jesus said, I don't call you uh, servants, I call you friends. And uh, he said, uh, doesn't it say that the spirit witnesses, we are God's children. So this is very intimate. This is very personal. We're, f we're family. And therefore what matters to Jesus also matters to, to us. The things that are on his heart become the things that, that are on our hearts. And so although he is the light to which we want everyone drawn to, somehow as his ambassadors and as his representatives on the earth now, we're, we're serving him because he's not physically present. The spirit has come so that we might do the works of Jesus here for him on his behalf. We can likewise begin to see uh, a family on earth emerging that, that is part of this wonderful family of God. And the more we get to know Jesus, the more we will find that our hearts are stirred for the things that are on his heart. So Revelation 7 verse 9, I won't look all the verses up just for the sake of time, but that verse talks about before the throne in heaven, every tongue, tribe, nation, language, culture will be represented singing, worthy, worthy, worthy as the lamb. That's the end game. That's where we're headed. And then in Isaiah uh, chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, it says, In the last days, the mountain of the Lord shall be established as chief among the mountains, and many peoples, many nations shall go, go to him and say, Come, let us go up to the house of the Lord. Now that's speaking about the church. The mountain of the Lord is the prophetic image of the church in the nations, saying that there are glorious end time purposes for God's church in the nations. Um, Acts 1 verse 8 says, go, you know, and, and in Mark 16, 15, we get the great commission, you know, go preach the gospel to all nations and I'll be with you. Um, you know, go and tell. Uh, Jesus is commissioning us because he knows that there are purposes that are going to come about that are on his heart. But I want you to notice in verse 2, it says, Behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. Now, um, but it says, the Lord will arise upon you. So the things that God calls us to get involved in are not reliant upon fair weather circumstances. We don't have to wait till it seems the right time before we do these things. 
darkness will cover the earth. There will be difficult things. The light will get lighter, but the dark will get darker. And we have to recognize even what we've been living through with, with COVID. That's a very darkening effect on the world, isn't it? In terms of the difficulties and the, the painfulness of all of that that's been going on. But in the midst of all of that, in the midst of all the chaos and the turmoil and the sadness and the, the, the grief and the lament, the promise is, but the, uh, the, um, the light, will, the Lord will arise on you. Light will come to us. There'll be something about his anointing on us, which means that darkness won't overcome it. So we've got to be confident that these things are, because they're God's idea, they're going to be fruitful. We, we don't have a master plan for how this is all going to happen. What we do have are promises that God has made. And when God makes a promise, he fulfills that promise by giving to each of us, everyone on this call and everyone who gets involved in the future in any kind of mission, whether it's at your, where you live now locally or whether it's a long way away from where you presently are, God gives each of us callings and stirrings and anointings of the spirit that we might be fruitful in the things he's called us to do. So we can't do it on our own, but God gives us power. He gives us anointing. He gives us gifts so that we can be fruitful for him. So the darkness isn't actually a match in the end for what we are carrying because it's not in our own strength. We don't have the ability. We cannot bring one person to know Christ. We can't see anybody saved. We can't heal anybody. We can't save anybody. We can't plant any churches. We can't do anything. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. So he's, he's making us realize right from the beginning, we are completely, utterly dependent on him. Even for the next breath we take in Job, it says, if it were God's intention and he withdrew his spirit, all mankind would perish together. We are even only breathing by the graciousness and providence and kindness of God. He's keeping us alive. So if we can't even do that simple thing of drawing our next breath without God's goodness, how can we think about bringing someone to Christ or planting a church? We've got to realize we're utterly, utterly dependent on God. But when God makes a promise, he will always complete it. And whether we feel weak, useless, naturally unable, whatever we feel ourselves to be, his empowerment, whether the darkness is thick around us and we think, goodness, this is a godless world. Maybe you're thinking of going somewhere and you think, wow, that's a real tough place to bring the gospel in. Listen, it's not about how tough it is, how dark it is. It's about what has God promised he wants to do. And he wants us simply to rest in his promises and just do simply, it's about obedience. It's not about anything else. Jericho, the walls of Jericho fell because of obedience. The, the, the city of Ai, a much smaller city, God's people saw defeat there initially. Why? Because there wasn't obedience. There was, there was compromise going on. So it's not about our own strength. It's knowing that the Lord will arise on us. Next, it says in verse four, lift up your eyes all around and see. Now, that speaks to me about not getting caught up in what's immediately around you. I often find if I walk along the, the, the beach uh, near where we live, I can end up with my eyes going down to look at the, the stones uh, in front of me. I can look where my feet are going because your head naturally goes down. And sometimes um, I'll then think, oh, let me just, I just got to lift my head. And you look out at the horizon, you can see the sea and the sky and the vastness of everything. And I think sometimes we have to remind ourselves, lift up your heads, lift up your eyes and see, get, get heaven's perspective on what's going on. Because daily life can kind of make you just kind of think, well, this is how it is. But there's, there's, a, there's a horizon that God wants us to look at. And he even encourages us in the prophecy there, lift up your eyes all around and see. The globe is to be viewed. This is a plant global. Lift up your eyes all around. God's not saying, well, 
don't look at that part of the world because that's too big for you or don't look over there because I really need some specialists over there. It's no, it's no good for people like you. No, look, lift up your eyes all around and see there's something God is promising and he wants us to understand that small beginnings and mustard seed size um, beginnings of things are the way he works that's that's how the kingdom works it's like a grain of mustard seed which almost seems so insignificant and you put it in the ground and you think well what's going to come of that my little life my gifting my my simple obedience compared to the needs of the world what does my little life count i can't even i can hardly see it it's it's, it's insignificant god plants little mustard seeds and when they're watered with faith and we just say, well, Lord, I'm trusting you, not in myself, I'm trusting you. Then the principle of the kingdom is that the mustard seed actually grows. And in the end, it becomes a huge tree that even birds sit in because it can take so much weight. God always begins with small beginnings. He always begins with people who think they're not able to do anything. He always begins with people who perhaps have tried and have failed and have thought, oh, I'm useless, I can't do it. God gets us somehow to the place where we are dependent on him. Why? Because in that place, it's so that God's power may rest on us. That's why Paul said at the beginning of the second book of Corinthians, he said, why did all these things happen? So that we might rely on God, not on ourselves. He'd been through all sorts of difficulties. He said, but this happened that we might rely on God. Brothers and sisters, we we need, as we're embarking on this kind of venture, thinking about the globe, we need to rely on God in a very, very real, tangible way. And you remember in 2 Corinthians 10, uh, 13 to 16, that mustard seed principle plays out because Paul says, um, well, I'll just tell you exactly what he says because it's an important uh, quote. I think it's something to, to bear in mind for our future. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 13, where he says, we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even to you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you, for we were the first to come to you all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. We do not boast beyond limit in the labors of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another man's area of influence. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So Paul has obviously got this. He's really, well, we've got nothing to boast about, but God has given us an area of influence. He's given it to us. He's, remember when God said to Joshua, every place you set your foot, I'll give to you. That's a, that's a promise. That's a great promise to have. Well, we have the same promise. Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. We've got the same promises that Joshua had. And there's been numbers of times I've been to cities with small teams, small prayer teams, and we've put our feet on the ground. I mean, I don't think you have to do that geographically, but we've just done it as a sort of a prophetic act, we've walked around the city, we've prayed, we've asked God to give us something there. And in every single place we've ever done that, either we have planted or one of the other spheres of New Frontiers has planted fairly soon after we've done that. So I, I, I think we can claim things that God has, he's assigned an area of influence. There's places he's given us that we can say, no, Lord, you've, you've given us this. And what's more, as our faith grows, so that area of influence increases even more. So we may have started in the UK. We then may have had a little bit more area of influence into Europe because our faith grew. I think our faith is now beginning to say, no, Lord, you've promised us some global impact here. So our area of influence is beginning to grow with our faith. Now, we've still got a long way to go. I feel I've got a long way to go. I'm still growing. I'm still learning. I'm, you know, I'm still at the, on the end of my life where you cut the end of the, the end portion of my life where I should have got there by now. But I think you're always learning. You're always saying, no, Lord, I want more. I want to have greater faith so that I can have a uh, see more of the area of influence that you've promised for us. 
And then the last bit in verse four, it says, then um, uh, lift up your eyes all around and see. They gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from afar and your daughters shall be carried on the hip. And for us, one of the key things that we really um, feel is important is that we're not, we're not sort of creating an organization. We're not extending a franchise. We're not trying to um, create some sort of denomination or branding all around the world. We're really not into that. What we're looking for is family. We're looking for spiritual sons and spiritual daughters that God will give us in the nations. And, and I I've, I've, can remember very, very powerful times, very meaningful times to me where, I've, again, I've just walked up and down the beach here and I've looked out at the sea and I've prayed. I've said, Lord, would you give us sons in Australia? Would you give us daughters in Africa? Would you give us sons in the Middle East? Would you give us sons and daughters in South America? I've gone around all the continents of the world and all the places I've prayed. I've said, give them to me, give them to us, Lord. Give us sons and daughters, give us a family around the world. And I really believe that I, I was praying a prophetic prayer and that God will answer it. And so what we're looking for is sons and daughters to emerge in the nations who carry the family DNA, who've got the values, who feel connected into a set of relationships that is part of God's family, our particular part of the family, the area of influence we've got. And I believe what we should believe for is that they'll, they'll come this wonderful time over the coming years where we see men and women emerging in different parts of the, in different parts of the globe in different nations and they'll start to be men and women of influence they'll start to bring people to Christ we'll start to see churches planted we'll start to see whole families of churches emerge in different parts of the world and we can help identify release and train whole apostolic families of churches right in different parts of the globe to me that's the end game to me that's the that's the reason we're doing this. It's not just so that we can have a great big, huge empire of relational mission. No, we, we want families, multi, multiple families all over the earth, the Middle East, uh, Africa, Australasia, South America, wherever, Europe. We, we want to see men and women emerge with, with the family DNA that we've been carrying and, and, and that there's, there's spiritual mothers and fathers there's spiritual sons and daughters, and it's, it's family kind of reproducing itself through the nations. If you think to yourself, people like Hudson Taylor, we can read about people like Hudson Taylor. But if, and if it wasn't for Hudson Taylor going to China, there would have been no people like Watchman Nee. There would have been no people like the massive millions of people there are in China now who know the Lord. But Hudson Taylor didn't go to build an empire. He went to bring the gospel. And then what happened was many indigenous Chinese people came to know the Lord and then planted many churches. And then there's now huge apostolic movements of churches because people went and, and took the family DNA uh, into China. Um, so it's important that we um, understand this is God's idea. This is not our idea. It's something I believe he is speaking to us about. And um, one sort of last thing I'd say is we mustn't ever underestimate the power of relationships in all of this. So to be even together on a Zoom call like this and to say, right, let's just get to know one another across the nations, even to hear the story uh, of Dan and Joel, even to hear little welcomes and introductions from different places people are coming in from just to get to know each other, to invest in, in uh, I don't know, ongoing things from here where we can just fellowship somehow over Zoom, even if we can't meet together very often because of geography or COVID or whatever. Investing in relationships is going to be massively important and probably more important the greater the geographical extremity. So I would say to anyone on this call in terms of um, you know, where to start with, with the journey that you're on. Start with the relationships. Ask God to give you friendships, relationships, connections with others who can get stirred up with you about the areas of the world that you're particularly wanting to be involved in.